To mark the first anniversary since work started to create the Steam VR simulation of the 1851 Great Exhibition, in this video, rather than add new exhibits, I am going to provide a tour. We start by Hyde Park's Prince of Wales Gate, between the West Lodge, built in 1846, and the East Lodge, built in 1851 to serve as a temporary police station during the exhibition. From here we can look along the whole front of the building, formed from 77 24-foot sections making a total length of 1,848 foot. The main entrance, under the arched transept roof is not quite in the middle of the building. The western side of the building stretches 864 foot from the transept, whereas the eastern side is 48 foot longer, stretching 912 foot. The semicircular fascia of the transept roof is divided into 12 sections, and these have been utilized as a clock face. To allow the clock face to fit into a half rather than a full circle, the clock's hands are double-ended. As they drop below the horizontal at the right, the other end rises above the horizontal at the left. Passing into the entrance lobby, on either side we can see the ticket booths and turnstiles for day visitors. In the middle are the desks where season ticket holders are admitted. Season tickets holders were required to sign a register on each entry. This allowed their signature to be verified against that on the ticket, and also allowed each entry to be logged. Here you can also see one of the mighty elm trees, the preservation of which led to the creation of the arched roof to fully enclose them. We now pass through the huge wooden doors into the south transept, and then through the park gates by Cottam and Hallen. In the centre of the south transept is an equestrian statue of Queen Victoria by Thomas Thornycroft. The original is lost, and so is represented here by a similar statue by the same artist outside St George's Hall in Liverpool. Lining both sides of the transept are sculptures, most by British sculptors. Just beyond the statue of Queen Victoria is a post box. There were three collections daily, Monday to Saturday. The exhibition was not open on Sundays. Now we come to the Crystal Fountain, four tons of glass, 27 foot high, with a basin 24 foot in diameter. The image of the fountain was adopted as a logo by Schweppes. The north half of the transept was similar to the south sculptures on either side. In pride of place here are equestrian statues of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert by James Wyatt. The original plaster models at the exhibition are lost, and so are represented here by Thomas Thornycroft's Victoria from Liverpool and Joseph Bohm's Albert from Windsor Great Park. Here are two more fountains. This one is by Rowan Hansen and is believed lost. Behind it is John Bell's Boy with Swan, now at the Colbrickdale Museum of Iron. Next we come to the Colbrickdale Gates. These are now in a slightly modified form on South Carriage Drive where it crosses West Carriage Drive, just a few hundred yards from their location within the Great Exhibition Building. Passing through the Colbrickdale Gates takes us into the main refreshment court. Schweppes paid £5,500 for the rights to be the exclusive caterer for the Great Exhibition. The actual running of the refreshment courts was subcontracted. The main refreshment court was subcontracted to Mr. Young Husband. The West and East refreshment courts were managed by Mr. Masters. Continuing north, we approach the Queen's entrance. To the right of this is the Queen's private retiring room. Strategically placed planters help shield the ladies' and gentlemen's waiting rooms from direct view. Moving into the gentlemen's waiting room, we can see both urinals and, within individual cubicles, George Jennings' first public flushing toilets. Note the hand pump arrangement, similar to a modern marine head. Visitors were required to pay one penny to use these toilets, and, although it may be apocryphal, this is said to be where the expression, to spend a penny, comes from. Leaving the gentleman's waiting room and returning to the crystal fountain, we look along the main avenue, or nave. The west was devoted to Britain and its colonies, the east to foreign states. The whole west side of the transept was devoted to India the jewel in the colonial crown. In the India section on the south side is a howdah mounted on an elephant. However, the only stuffed elephant which could be located in England was an African elephant. Moving back to the nave, there are several sculptures where we have models of the actual item displayed at the exhibition, the Duke of Rutland which was, until April 2024, in the marketplace in Leicester. The statue is now in storage during redevelopment of the site. Horse and Dragon now in the grounds of Stratfield Say House. Sir William Follett now in Westminster Abbey. 
and here is a piece with a rather long title, The Faithful Friend of Man Trampling Underfoot His Most Insidious Enemy, now at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Turning south we enter the section devoted to the province of Canada, corresponding to modern-day Quebec and Ontario. Among the items in this section are a canoe, a sleigh, and a fire engine which won a prize at the exhibition. From the Canada section we move into the British Sculpture Court. There were approximately 100 pieces displayed in this court. So far we have included 14 of these, some as models, others as cut-out billboard images until models can be generated. Returning to the nave and crossing to the other side we come to the Fine Arts Court. Displayed here were statuettes and busts, a pair of console tables, now at Osborne House, and copies of various famous paintings which were admitted for display not as works of art, but to demonstrate techniques for image reproduction on various materials. Back into the nave we pass a stone cross decorated with scenes from the Bible, either side of which are columns of madripoor marble from Devon. We pass a cabinet displaying papier-mâché goods and a decorated piano by John Broadwood, to reach the magnificent sculpture of brothers Lords Eldon and Stoll, now at University College Oxford. Beyond that is a turret clock by Dent. After the exhibition this clock was installed at King's Cross Station, where the mechanism remained in use for nearly 100 years, before being replaced with a more modern mechanism. Now we turn north into the machinery at Rest Court, where we find the great hydraulic press which was used to raise the box sections of the Britannia Bridge over the Menai Strait. Beyond this is a Naismith steam hammer. Returning to the nave we come to the Colbrookdale Dome, inside which is one of two full-sized copies of John Bell's Eagle Slayer displayed at the exhibition. Continuing west we pass a lighthouse lens and the Ross telescope. Turning north once again we enter the building court. Here we find a cross-section of a building showing the construction techniques for Prince Albert's model houses for the labouring classes. A complete model house consisting of four three-bedroom family flats was constructed across the road from the exhibition building in Hyde Park Barracks. After the exhibition it was moved to Kennington where it is now used as the headquarters for the charity, Trees for Cities. Continuing north from here we enter the Western Refreshment Court. This has open courts to allow the preservation of the trees. A similar arrangement also exists for the Eastern Refreshment Court. Returning to the nave we continue west passing another lighthouse lens beyond which is a model of Liverpool docks. Above the western entrance is an organ by Willis, now in Winchester Cathedral. Passing out of the building, we have so far added only a few exhibits here. To the north is the cheese ring column. This was purchased by Samuel Stevens Marling who had a stand in the mixed fabrics and shawls section of the exhibition. It is now approximately 300 metres north of All Saints Church in Selsley, near Stroud. Also here are samples of anchors and railway level crossing gates. To the west is a statue of Richard Coeur de Leon. This is a model of the bronze casting now in Old Palace Yard, Westminster, based on the plaster version shown at the exhibition. We now re-enter the building and pass through the southern side, where currently we have only a few items. Here is a statue of William Wallace. This is actually a model of the statue now in Baltimore, which is based on the statue on the Wallace Monument outside Stirling, which in turn is similar to the stone statue which was displayed at the exhibition. Beyond this are various stands in the agricultural section. Passing these takes us back past the British Sculpture Court and the Canadian section and back to the south transept where we first entered the building. We have already noted that the entire west side of the transept is devoted to India, and the theme of the Orient continues on the east side. The northeast was allocated to Persia and the Ottoman Empire, the southeast to China and Tunis. Moving east we come to the Koh-i-Noor diamond, displayed in a large birdcage-style enclosure. Behind that, the shield presented as a christening gift by the King of Prussia to Queen Victoria's and Prince Albert's first son, Albert Edward Prince of Wales. Next are three large statues. On the north side, Dr. Jenner, now in Kensington Gardens, based on the plaster model shown at the exhibition. In the middle, the Marquis of Butte, now in Callaghan Square, Cardiff, also based on a plaster model at the exhibition. On the south side, John Flaxman, now at University College London. Returning to the middle we find the earthen wine jar or tanaja from Toboso in Spain. We then go north, passing an embroidered Spanish coat of arms towards the France and Algeria corridor, and into a room which is the French equivalent of the British Fine Arts Court. 
Here are Beauvais and Gobelin tapestries, Sevres porcelain, and other French works of art. Returning once again to the nave, through some sculptures in the Rome section, in front of us is Highland Mary, now at the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool. Continuing east we pass a French fountain and organ, then several French sculptures, and then through the Belgian section. We come to the huge window by Bertini, Dante and some of his ideas. Coming back out of the enclosure for the window, we see Radetzky, which stands outside the Austrian sculpture court. We now move into the German section. In 1851 Germany comprised several separate states. A number of these traded in a customs union or Zollverein. Here are several significant German sculptures. Resting deer by Rauch now on a gate to Potsdam Wild Park. Amazon and Tiger by Kiss a copy of the original outside the Alters Museum in Berlin. King George of Podobrady and Libusa Queen of Bohemia both by Schwanthaler and now in the National Museum in Prague. Between them is Khalid's boy with Swan now at Osborne House. Although the model here is of another copy now in Poland. Here is one of the lions now part of the Quadriga on Munich Siegester, represented here by a model of a similar lion from Nicaragua. Next we have two horse with handler statues. Represented here by sculptures in France and Austria, similar to those from the exhibition which are now in Die Rossbandige Stuttgart. Beyond this we come to the United States section. Hiram Powers' Greek slave is in front of a model bridge. And to conclude our virtual visit to the Great Exhibition, above the eastern entrance in the gallery is an organ by Gray and Davison, now at St. Anne's Limehouse. We will continue to add exhibits and fixtures and fittings to this simulation which will be released free of charge in September 2024.